Hi and welcome back to a new video. On my table you can see the Corsair Voyager A1600, which is the first notebook they ever made. And now you might also ask yourself, is it necessary that there is another manufacturer, like notebook manufacturer on the market? And probably the answer is no. But then also while testing, you will straight figure out that there's definitely some things that Corsair is doing better than all the others. But there are also some parts where Corsair definitely still has to improve. And that's what we're going to check out in today's video. The laptop is fully AMD based. We have either a Ryzen 7 6800HS or a Ryzen 9 6900HS, but both CPUs are extremely similar. Like they have the same amount of cores, same amount of cache, only difference is a slight difference in the core clock. Same goes to the iGPU inside the CPU only 10% clock difference there. The main difference between the two different versions that will be available is memory size. So 16 versus 32 gigabyte of DDR5 memory and one terabyte versus two terabyte SSD size. We will definitely take it apart in a second to check the cooling solution because they're heavily advertising vapor chamber cooling, which I think is not really that special. We already had a like a Razer device two or three years ago that already had like a full huge vapor chamber to cool everything. So yeah, I will just be curious what kind of like parts you can maybe replace such as like the SSD and memory and all of that. And then we will definitely check out the cooling as well. But before we get to that, it's still a heavy marketing term. It's called slipstream wireless integration, but I think that's still a very, very nice feature about this because if you have other Corsair devices such as like this headset, like a Corsair Virtuoso SE, then you can directly connect this with your notebook without the need of having those like USB dongles and stuff. So all of them can be connected which I think is a very good thing. If you are in this Corsair bubble already that you have a lot of Corsair devices, then it might make sense to get this. But apart from that, I'm not quite sure. And that's why we will straight get to some benchmarks because we definitely have to discuss the price. Even though this is more like a, a conclusion thing, I still straight want to get to this. We will now compare the Voyager A1600 with an ASUS Strix G15 Advantage Edition. Simply because they have a very similar hardware configuration. The ASUS notebook also comes with the 6800M. It has a Ryzen 9 5900HX and only DDR4 memory, only 16 gigabyte while this has 32. And the rest is pretty much identical. And that's the same for the performance. Even though the ASUS notebook costs 1000 euro less, actually a bit more than 1000 euro less. So hopping into Cinebench R20, you can see that at least on paper, the 6900HS is a bit faster, but that's a few percent. And to have some gaming benchmarks, we're starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla in 1440p, so WQHD Ultra. You can see it's about one or two FPS difference in all of the gaming benchmarks, same for Battlefield 2042. And only in PUBG, because this is like an eSport setting, so very low um, details and everything, there it's about 10% difference. And that's mainly because the CPU is a bit faster. But apart from that, I can tell you that even though this is over 1000 euro more expensive, performance wise, you will not be able to tell a difference. At this point, I definitely asked myself, is there anything to justify a price difference of over 1000 euro? And I can tell you that it has definitely some features that you cannot find anywhere else. We're just starting off with the screen, even though that's something you can find in different devices. It has a resolution of 2560 times 1600 pixel. So a 16 to 10 ratio display, which is pretty rare or not existing in the desktop market, but definitely more common in the notebook market because you just have more space in the height to work with. It's 100% sRGB, which at least on paper should be great for any kind of content creation. And it has 240 Hertz. So just talking about the monitor, that's already great. But what I really like is the Steam Deck integration, which you can find directly underneath. So you have 10 of these macro keys which are directly connected to the Stream Deck software, which you can completely configure yourself. Most of you are probably familiar with the Stream Deck. For example, for my own use, at least when I was testing, I put Hardware Info, for example, on button 10. So it works great every time I'm booting up the notebook, I need to open Hardware Info again, just press the button, because that is something that works great with the Stream Deck software that you can just put everything on there. No matter if you want to change something in like OBS, some scene changes, you can do that. While performing all my tests, I noticed that randomly the macro keys didn't work anymore and I didn't know why. Especially in this moment when I was pressing S1, instead of opening this macro bar, it was just changing the brightness of the display, which was really strange. And after some investigation, I noticed that this happens if IQ is not running in the background anymore. 
IQ after leaving the standby mode just randomly crashed and then you couldn't use the macro keys anymore. But Corsair is already aware of this and is working on it. And then there was one more weird thing I found and this happened if you used the Windows key lock function. Basically there is this button to lock the Windows key so you don't open your taskbar anymore. And if you use that and then for example you were looking for IQ because it crashed again and I just opened it and wanted to press ICUE in there, it just randomly opened like Explorer and other tools. I'm not sure why I couldn't use the search bar anymore, but I also reported this to Corsair. But when it works, it works quite well. So if you press the button S1, then you can get this bar visible in case you forgot what kind of, I don't know, functions you put on where. So for example, for me on S10, I put Hardware Info, so you can just easily launch that. Could disable definitely the user control thing, but apart from that, this works very well. In between these macro keys, you also have this tiny display where you can see the battery of your notebook and you can also go to like the clock and you can also get, for example, the CPU utilization. And this tiny display can be configured in the Corsair IQ if you go to this S key macro bar setting. And there it's like, it's German, but it says display configuration. Basically, you can have your three displays that, you that I just showed you, for example, the battery, the time, and then you have an additional one. You can also add another one. But the thing is, this is pretty much useless. So you can add a fourth, but there is nothing else you can display. For example, if you go on here, that currently tells me the CPU utilization. If I go to widget and then like system information, the only thing that I can display is either the clock or the utilization of the CPU. And here that's the battery of the notebook. That's it. There are only these three things. Like why is there not maybe memory utilization, CPU clock, CPU temperature, GPU temperature, like all the hardware information you could get or like the profile you're running, the fan speed profile, everything is missing in here. I don't know why. And one more thing I just don't understand why this exists is a touchpad with 15 times 10 centimeters in size. The good thing about this is that you have this button on top. So if you double tap this, then you can like fully disable the entire touchpad. That's a cool function. On the top right, if you double tap this, you're basically disabling like two thirds of the touchpad. So I will try to make this visible on the camera. So you can see the cursor on my screen. And if I just move over, then it suddenly stops. But like you have no feedback on at which point it will stop. So that is like, to me, it never felt like natural because I never knew when I was using this at what point the mouse will stop. And then it feels like, I don't know, sometimes this feels like it's partially broken. It would maybe be better if there would be like a line on here you could actually feel with your finger to know at which point this is like partially limited, but I don't understand why this function even exists and I don't understand why you need such a huge touchpad. Bundled in the Voyager, there is also this software which is called the Corsair Diagnostics. And even though it looks quite nice on the first look because you can get easy access to information such as like what, what kind of CPU do you have, what kind of motherboard, in case you forgot after you just purchased the device, what I found quite surprising is that they're using a Samsung SSD, even though it's a quite good one, it's a PM, 9A1, so that's still a PCI Express 4.0 SSD, very quick, very reliable, so nothing to complain about. I was just surprised that Corsair is not using a Corsair SSD in their own device. But apart from that, there are those functions on top left. So you have those custom design test analysis things, and you have this rapid stress checkup, where you can check if something does not work on your device. But I can tell you that there is something that does not work about the software. Right now I'm running all those tests simultaneously. As you can see, it's testing CPU memory, storage, GPU, video memory, stress test, and ethernet. What I want to complain about is mainly the GPU and SSD test, because if you scroll down to your RX 6800M, you can see that this is not doing anything. You can tell by, I mean, I had it open for five minutes, so it's basically the entire test. You can see the, like total peak power was a few watts, so it was never active. The 6800M was never active. This test is only testing the iGPU. You can definitely do that, so you, can, you could test your iGPU first and then maybe on the second test have your dedicated GPU tested. But right now it's only testing the iGPU, it will never test the 6800M and at the end it will tell you that everything is all right in a few minutes, which you just never know. But now we will go over to the SSD. 
and you can see the test is, oh, it's 100% done. And the total read and write rates we had during the test was 117 megabyte per second and 60 megabyte per second. Like read activity max was not even 80%. How is this test going to tell if everything or anything is going to work fine? The test is broken, so it cannot tell you if your device is broken. After the test, we know it says passed, time elapsed five minutes. And just to verify, if we check in hardware info, you can see it was open the entire time for almost nine minutes and yeah, there was like no activity on the SSD at all. If you go to the results, it will tell us that everything is perfectly fine. It's even listing the RX 6800M, even though it was never tested, same for the SSD. And just to show that it is the Corsair diagnostic software and this SSD definitely will perform as it should. Just running Crystal Disk Mark, you can see 6500 megabyte per second in read. You can also see peak was almost 5000 megabyte per second in write. So that's all as expected. SSD is exactly performing as it should. And this is putting the SSD under stress as it should be. One thing I really like though about the Voyager is the cooling and noise level. And that's something I want to highlight under pretty tough conditions because right now in Germany it's really warm. I have about 31 degrees Celsius right here in my studio because I simply don't have an AC. And that's why everything we're testing with the Voyager right now is under pretty tough conditions. Also all the gaming benchmarks you saw, they were taken yesterday at about 29 degrees Celsius. So that's definitely a bit tougher than maybe under a very controlled environment with like 20 degrees Celsius. But then again, who is really gaming at 20 degrees Celsius might also be that if you want to play in summer, you want to know about the potential performance. Literally the cool thing for me about the Voyager is that especially in idle while I was browsing things, installing devices and everything, you cannot really hear anything. The fan was mostly passive or either running at very, very low speed. And even if I start Cinebench R20 now, the fan is not ramping up. It takes more than 80% of the benchmark for the fan to even start. And that is at an ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. The peak CPU temperature I could see was 82 degrees Celsius and the CPU package power was also peaking above 80 watt. So this indicates that there's definitely a good headroom for cooling even for warm days. So that's one thing Corsair did quite well on the Voyager. And because we obviously want to know how this device can cool this well, we will open it up and check out the internals. We can simply remove the cover by getting first out those normal Phillips head screws. Once we have the cover removed, inside of the cover we can find two thermal pads. And that is because those are the possible positions for M.2 drives. One is occupied from the start, in this case with the two terabyte SSD, but there's also an optional spot. So if you ever run out of space, you can easily hook up a second one and it will straight be cool. So you don't even have to add a second thermal pad. Memory wise, we have normal notebook dims, which means that you can also basically buy the cheaper version with a 16 gigabyte. And if you ever need 32, you can easily upgrade it yourself. Maybe also get a cheaper memory kit. Those memory modules, by the way, are running with 4800 mega transfers C40, which is a bit slow, even though it is DDR5. But right now, at least in Germany, you cannot even find any DDR5 sticks that would be faster than this. And as I said before, you could think about like cheaping out and getting the cheaper version, even though it's not really cheap, but getting the cheaper version of the notebook with a 16 gigabyte of memory and then upgrade yourself to a 32 gigabyte and sell the included 16 gigabyte. But then you also have to keep in mind that finding somebody to sell those DDR5 sticks to with SODIM is not that easy right now. The Voyager is cooled by this huge vapor chamber, which we're going to disassemble in a second. I just noticed that the screw markings are quite interesting. At least I have never seen markings like this before. So for example, you have the G3, you have the B5, and then you have like an S7. And I was wondering what are they even like marking? And then once I took out the screws, I noticed there are like goldish screws, a silver one and a black one. So the black one goes up here with B, so that's probably black. The G is always for the golden screws and the S is for the silver one. Maybe they have different spring forces or something. I'm not quite sure about that, but at least that's something I have not seen so far. And here we have the vapor chamber. It's mainly made out of copper for the CPU and the GPU part. The other surrounding material, I was not quite sure if it's like some like zinc material or if it was aluminum, I was not quite sure. I did some scratching tests, but I'm 
still not quite true. Anyway, the imprints for thermal paste are good, so nothing to complain about. Also, everything regarding thermal pads, seatings on those and everything looks great to me. Now time to draw a small conclusion about the Voyager A1600. From my point of view, they did much better as when they stepped into the monitor market first. So that is a very good product, but it definitely needs some improvement, especially when it comes to the software. So that's the first thing I want to talk about, especially Corsair IQ. I mean, first of all, it's good that they have IQ integrated because if you're familiar with how to use it and you have your other devices, such as maybe a mouse and your headset, you want to connect it over the slipstream receiver, then it's definitely a good thing to have IQ in there. But it's also a bad thing to have IQ in there simply because it's not stable and keeps crashing and I'm not sure why. It happens after standby mode, doesn't matter if it's battery or if you run on the cable. In both scenarios, IQ often keeps crashing. And if it crashes, then you lose functionality of your macro buttons. So that's something they definitely have to look into. Same goes for the Corsair Diagnostics software. If it wants to be a diagnostic software, then it also has to be a diagnostic software. Because right now, it's telling you pass, but you have no idea what it's doing. You don't get any kind of like values, like numerical values. For example, a score the CPU should achieve and then something it achieved. Like there's nothing to compare. You never know what it's doing and if it's doing great or not, because right now for the SSD or for like the GPU, it's not even testing it. So you cannot really call it a diagnostic software. They definitely have to improve there. So much about software. Hardware wise, just the general shape, the materials they use, the build quality is top notch. Like nothing to complain about. The speakers, the keyboard is absolutely great. Like the choice of switches is perfect. Wouldn't complain about this at all. Layout is great. Touchpad, I'm not sure about the size as I said before. Maybe you can enlighten me why you need such a massive thing. For me, like 50% of the size would be completely fine. Regarding DDR5, you could argue that it's the latest technology and that's something great to have in there. But right now, because you're running 4800, which is really not fast, and yeah, they're also not that cheap. I'm not sure if it really is a benefit to have DDR5 in there, but for future upgradability, definitely might be a good option. I guess for the future, we will also see quicker DDR5 SO DIMMs like 5200 mega transfer modules for the future. The performance overall is great. Cannot complain about this at all, but then at the same time, you get the same performance with devices that cost more than 1000 euro or less. So you definitely have to think about if it's worth getting those additional like technical features, which in some regard might make sense, especially if you want to look at this from a streaming point of view. But also if you look at this from a streaming point of view, I'm wondering why is there not a LAN port in there, like an ethernet port? Like if this wants to be a streaming device, I personally think it definitely deserves to have a full size ethernet port in there, which you can definitely find on other devices with the same size. So I'm not sure why this is missing if it wants to be a streaming or creator device. Overall though, considering that it's the first notebook that came from Corsair, it's definitely a good product, but it's quite expensive. But it's up to you to decide if that's something you would buy or not. Just technically speaking, they have to improve the software side of things, definitely with IQ. Like if it keeps crashing, then having those buttons on there can also be annoying. Apart from that, pretty nice device. And also thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.